All right. I'm live after a while now. It's the Nazarite bringing you Hebrew Lord from days of yore. Hello to someone who's here. At least YouTube says someone is here. I'm not sure if they were and they left or hi. Good evening. It's been <clears throat> it's been a while. The cough that has barred me from this persistent post-COVID cough, which has barred me uh, or had barred me in the last few months from broadcasting regularly, is, as I said, going away slowly but surely. And I felt a real need to set a date and go back to broadcasting. And hopefully, because I don't know what the future holds, hopefully this is the first of many after uh, a few months of relative silence. I really do want to make this work, but I don't want to make any promises or make any you know, or make, make any assumptions, things I won't be able to hold up. Hello, yet another person joins. Hi, welcome. So, morning, anointing, rebuilding. And it starts with a story, a very quick story, just from today when I was at work in the office. And it's a few days before the fast of the 9th of Av. The 9th of Av itself is on a, on a Saturday, on Shabbat. Hello, Robert. Hi. And we will be fasting from Saturday night until Sunday night, right? It's a 25, roughly 25 hours of a fast. <clears throat> it's one of several fasts throughout the year that are a fast of mourning, unlike Yom Kippur, the holiday of atonement, Chag Kippurim, which is a holiday of, well, of joy and celebration and uh, fasting, a fast of joy and celebration. But I digress. A few days before the 9th of Av, and so I'm having lunch. Yesterday, excuse me, in the office, not this morning. Yesterday in the office. And I go, you know what? I'm still holding out to perhaps not needing to fast this year. In other words, it's hypothetically possible that we will not need to fast. And so me and a few others who were at the table, we got into a discussion over whether or not it's actually feasible, right? Whether or not it's actually possible that we would have uh, let's say a revelation of a, of a person, a situation, we anoint somebody and these days of mourning throughout the year become days of celebration as it says in the prophets. Hey, Khalid is here. Hello. Good to see you. Good to see you. And a few more join. I'm so blessed to just go live after all this time. And I feel like Voldemort, right? When he, when he presses on the dark mark after so many years and all those death eaters just materialize in front of him and he goes out. Oh, it's just as if it was yesterday. You know, I call you when you are here. <laughs> hello, hello, indeed. Now, I am of the opinion, as some of you who follow may know, that Messiah, the temple, right? A human, a building, those are all well and good, so to speak. But there's something that goes even beyond that, right? And that's the individual, the divinity of the, of the, of the individual, and not necessarily the king, right? But we become our own kings, and not necessarily a building, right? We are, we become the temple of God, that whole shtick. Now, I didn't give him that whole spiel when you were speaking, but the person next to me said, you know, I just don't see it happening. I think that we're going to fast this year, and I think that even if there was somebody who was worthy of being anointed, it wouldn't be able to go down that fast. It wouldn't be able to happen that quickly. Now, Again, who's to say, right? But I'm of the, uh, and I was, I stood firm uh, because there's this idea, for better or worse, of Messiah, right? And I've spoken many times of Messiah, the anointed one, right? Whoever that is these days, there's always a contender for the crown. There's always somebody who is worthy. The question is, are we worthy as a people to crown the king, to uh, anoint him, and to start that process? It may not be absolutely necessary as far as I'm concerned, uh, concerned long term, right? A building, a monarchy. And even Shmuel, and this was also brought up in our discussion, Shmuel the prophet, he said, no, Adonai is your king. Follow him. Do not ask a king of flesh and blood like all the other nations. And, you know, that, that whole thing went down in the book of, of Shmuel. And he tells the people, okay, if you and your king follow the, the divine, right? And if you follow the Torah and the commandments, then everything will turn out just fine. And the, right, the, the king will, the king will serve long on his throne and give it to his son and, uh, you know, so on and so forth. The kingship itself was not part of the original plan. And that's a, a debate, a machloket. 
in uh, right based on the actual verses in the Torah dealing with the monarchy and the kingship and and the different rules and regular and, and and how the king conducts himself etc right he writes his own Torah he keeps it that whole thing and so mourning right now we are in the days of mourning the days between the straits the days of leading to the ninth of Av and whether or not we'll be able or whether or not we will be fasting this year I don't know the future right now we are still in these days of mourning many people practice a no meat and no wine policy during the days from the first of Av to the ninth of Av as we get closer to the day of fasting like I said this year it ends up on Shabbos we fast on the Sunday following it from Saturday night until Sunday night but there is a very interesting idea of the Shabbat bypassing the holiday the only holiday uh, bypassing the fast the only time when uh, it is Shabbat and you fast is the fast of joy on the holiday of atonement Yom Kippur but right now we are still in mourning now you could argue and I do make the argument that there is too much mourning compared to the amount of let's say deliverance and oh divine revelation right that that is occurring all around me and I'm saying it here in Jerusalem you know but you could spread that out worldwide to some degree if you choose to see it that way and so the morning is alongside me and others acknowledging that there is a very very uh, different vibe going on a vibe of deliverance and of redemption and even if there's still a lot of a lot of terrible things going on here and elsewhere in the world that should not negate the fact that I, as a human being, as a Hebrew man here in Israel, and others, like as I said, we're feeling that different vibe. People call it um, the mindset of deliverance, right? The mindset of, of, well, what the Torah and the commandments are getting at, right? That, that means to an end. Messiah is in there. The temple is in there. The tabernacle is in there. All the different artifacts are in there. It's a means to an end. And where that end is has to do a lot more with the individual. So we're still mourning as individuals and as a people, right? It will culminate, let's say, on the ninth of Av with the fast. And then there's the idea of the anointing of, of Messiah, where I said, as I've said before, there are many potential Messiahs at any given time. The question is, do we merit it? Will we be able to recognize uh, this person and anoint him? to start that process, if it's meant to transpire, right? If it's meant to be, it, there will be a lot of controversy and debate and, and well, let's just leave it at that. When it comes to the Messiah, many people will not believe. I think that Christians hold the same view, right? That there will be many non-believers and, and that's part of their whole shtick, right? To bring people back to the flock because there are so many non-believers and there is the idea that there will be war, whether it's civil war in the people of Israel or whether it's war externally, particularly with the, uh, let's say, kingdoms of Arabia, Malchut Arab, as it's known. Anointing and rebuilding, they don't have to follow necessarily. They don't have to be a linear thing where A leads to B leads to C. It can be There can be something which is, let's say, a wonder, a pele something which goes right to the heart of the issue, right to the root of things, bypasses this idea of kingship, monarchy, a temple, and all the precious metals and stones and fabrics, and the service in its physical form. I've said it before many times, that is an option. Rebuilding, where I see it again as if a third temple will be rebuilt, I really do honestly hope it's a vegan one where... We'll, we will all be able to worship right together as a unified human people if that is what's meant to be. And I still say, despite all of that, it's up to us, right? It's up to us to know when to mourn and when to be glad. It's up to us to be worthy of anointing, be worthy of being anointed. Whether or not we're supposed to be Messiah is regardless, that's beside the point. We ought to be acting right in the in a way of faith, of Torah, commandments, and covenant, where even we would be worthy of being anointed as a uh, as a leader, let's say, because we're trying to lead ourselves and rebuilding. I always bring it down to the level of the individual. We were the original temple of God, right? This human form, this selim, this image of God that human beings can potentially be. 
and embody. These times of mourning are here so we can make tshuva, as it's known, to return. We are returning to ourselves, God willing, and subsequently, as, the, as Rav Kook says in Orota Tshuva, in the lights of repentance, of returning, he says the, the primordial or genesis of tshuva, the original, the first, the prime, the cardinal tshuva returning, is that a person returns to him or herself, and immediately, as a consequence of that, they will be returning to God. I, speaking of mourning, occasionally I still have thoughts of my old channel and all of the videos on Orota Chuva that, that were there. <laughs> Let's go to the chat and see if there's anything there. And I thank you all for being here. Just happily, you know, I'm happily accepting this, humbly and happily accepting uh, these, you know, these messages, these likes, these views. It's so nice to do this again after uh, a few good weeks. So let's see. He's back, says Robert. Much anticipated return. Thank you. Hi, says Khalid. I've been busy. I had a fight last week. Two-round TKO. A technical... Well, who won? Let us know. It's kickboxing, right? Yes, if I'm not mistaken, Khalid's into kickboxing. So wait, a, T a TKO. Who Who's yours or his? Or hers? <clears throat> hello, hello, says Oregon Freebird. Hi to you. Are you still living in Israel? Yes, I am. And in exactly two weeks, it's going to be one year since I moved back from the Netherlands. And what a year it's been. Wow. Maybe I'll do a... Uh, I, you know what? Let's let's say this. In the spirit of me going back to broadcasting regularly, God willing, not making any promises, Lord knows I want it. But in the spirit of that, let's say that in two weeks-ish, I'll do a video on a year back in Israel after three years in the Netherlands and that could be interesting. So yes, I'm still living in Israel. Very much so. In Yerushalayim, doing my thing. I would say it's a lifestyle you live, says Khalid. It annoys me that as Muslim people think the black stone, right, in, in the Mecca, uh, the Kaaba, the, the Kaaba? Yeah, the Kaaba, gives me them benefits. It's just a worthless stone. Well, I wouldn't say worthless, because much like, let's say, the stones in the breastplate of the high priest in the Choshen, they serve a purpose. There is utility there. Now, it was used the breastplate in in the for, in, in some in different forms of worship, and in order to give, let's say, advice or answers to the king or the Sanhedrin, or, or a prophet. I understand those who would say that the Kaaba is a is a worthless stone, and I definitely do understand those who make the Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca, and who to, and who go around it right, in prayer, and who bow in Muslim fashion, and ancient Hebrew fashion, uh, I might add, who bow in front of it. Now, people didn't used to bow necessarily in front of the stones uh, in the Hebrew faith. That would be taking it too far, perhaps. But I understand conceptually why the stone would be worthless to some and, and, and immeasurable, uh, you know, to others, without, you know, beyond worth, <clears throat> beyond measure. Mashlom Chas is spooky, my bro. Hello, good to see you. Mashlom Pa means how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you. I hope you're all doing well as well. Khalid said, I would say God gives us a responsibility to tell others and give them advice within reason. Telling others. This I mentioned in the past, that there is a, there's a bit in the Gemara. If I'm not mistaken, it's the Gemara, maybe the Midrash, right? The Talmud and possibly the Midrash where the, the our sages are saying, I think it was Rabbi Akiva who said back in the times of the Second Temple when it was still standing, mind you. And he said, I uh, doubt whether there is a person in this generation, he said back then, 2,000 years ago, that knows how to rebuke others. Another sage said, I doubt whether there is a person in, the, in these generations that knows how to receive rebuke. Oh, and then there was one sage who said something else. Where was it? To rebuke. I don't remember the third one. But to tell others and give them advice within reason, I always say when it comes to that, do not give unsolicited advice. And if you're going to, be very precise in your speech. You should be precise in your speech either way. But <clears throat> if you're going to give unsolicited advice, you need to know your audience and, uh, and tread lightly. Because... Some people would be completely turned off by people giving them advice. Some people give advice, but they actually want you to do it and would consider it disappointing if you didn't go through with it because somehow it might reflect on them as whatever it is that they build up in their head. I've known people who take it as a responsibility 
to tell others, give advice, sometimes completely unsolicited, take offense when that advice is not heeded, and do it all in the name of what? I'm not, I'm just being honest with you. And now I'll quote the Berenstein Bears, you know, there's a difference between being honest and being downright rude, said Papa. Yes, there's a difference between that. I hope that, uh, obviously, if somebody comes to you, give them advice. You know, what does, uh, oh, who was it? That journalist, right? Advice is a form of nostalgia. It's, it's going back into the past and fishing things out and shining them up and presenting them as a new thing. There's a lot of great advice to be given and heeded. And to be able to tell others, let's say in the form of rebuke or whether it's just friendly advice, this is something that's reminiscent of the tribe of Levi and what they used to do, right? The priests and Levites were the ones who primarily, or at least to some degree, maybe to a great degree, taught the people of Israel Torah so there's uh, there's something there that I can connect with, and it's probably just in some ways why I do this. So let's see, Job nineteen twenty five. Let's see, says Spooky. We're gonna go to Job nineteen twenty five. For I know what's this. This is oh, you know what? You know what? I'll just read from the New International Version, even though the JPS. Oh, you know what? I'll, I'll search for the JPS Tanakh. As I've said before, it's my favorite. Uh, translation, at least so far. Let's see if I could find it quickly here without wasting y'all's time. JPS Tanakh. JPS Tanakh. So Job 19, what is this? Job 19.25. Spooky wanted. Uh, Spooky put it in the chat. Let's read it. Okay. But as for me, I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he will witness at the last upon the dust. Go'ali, the one who redeems me. And I think that it's connecting with that image of God within us, to that divine spark, that divine speech that echoes within us, connecting with that, connecting with our true self, as it were. <laughs> However you want to take that, <laughs> you feel free to take it. <clears throat> so yes, indeed, my Redeemer liveth. Uh, it's um, when people in... When people in uh, in the Torah, let's say, and in other places in the Tanakh, when they want to, let's say, make a vow or take a stand, they say, Chai Adonai, as God lives. And they say, Chai Adonai, Cha. And they say, Chai, for a human being. Chai, for instance, there was... Um, no, you know what? Let's not go there. Let's not go there. Forget that. But, Yeah. The, the the source of all life, that revelation of God that is life itself. My Redeemer liveth. Yov. Job has some really, really... No, way. you know what? Let's take that in context for a moment here. We're talking about Job 19. Who's the one who's speaking there? Is it Job himself? I'm going back. Yeah, Job answered. <coughs> for Job... Uh, for Job to answer and say that his Redeemer lives, it's towards the end of the book, right? After his three friends have said what they said and he's answered them, right? It had to do with rebuke. It had to do with them speaking. It had to do with <laughs> with him eventually. Wait, is it Job answering God? No, I think it's Job answering one of his friends. If I'm not mistaken, it's not God from the storm quite yet. Just a second. Let's see. All uh, right, so he answers Bildad. Okay, so yeah, he, he spoke to Bildad and not to God. That comes later in the book. Speaking to his friends, Job says, I know my Redeemer lives, even after everything. Now, some say that Job never happened. It's all metaphor, allegory, right, a story. Some say that about the entire Tanakh, but that specific thing is mentioned in, uh, in the Talmud, if I'm not mistaken, that there's one sage who says that uh, Yov, Job never really was. It's all allegory. For Job to say, my Redeemer liveth, uh, somebody who's been through so much, even if it's only conceptual. His friends are trying to tell him, you know, maybe you should try to do better. So let's see. Spooky. I hope there was context. I mean, I just went into that verse and maybe I spoke of it too much at length. What is the connection? What is the, what is the context in which you <coughs> are bringing, putting forth that verse, Jaden Matilla, I'm a Nazarite. Hello, Jaden. Hi. 
You're a Nazarite. I am curious. What type of Nazarite are you? Please do share more information. I'm always happy to uh, encounter and meet new Nazarites. Hello, says Eiler. Hello, hello to you. Robert, what's up, says Spooky. Oregon says, I stopped waiting for a Messiah seven years ago and decided to save myself. Best decision ever. I can completely and utterly sympathize. I know what you mean. Now, when people sometimes around me, right, they have this great faith in Mashiach. It's one of the 13 principles of faith as brought down by Maimonides, taking a page from earlier books and teachings. And the third one, the 13th principle of faith, <clears throat> is I believe in complete, right, wholeheartedly. I have faith in the coming of the Messiah. And even though he may linger, or uh, even though he may be, even though he may be, uh, what would be the word, held back, I will wait for him. Uh, every day for him to come. I look forward to his coming every single day. There is, as I've said, a lot of good things about having that idea of the anointed one. And even if you look in the book of Kings, and even if you look in the book of Shmuel, and, and you see exactly what those kings were doing at the time, having that as a symbol, having that as, uh, as a revelation of the kingdom of God to some degree, the revelation of the kingdom, of the kingship in human form, <coughs> That line going right through the 10 spheros from Keter to Malchut, right? The crown of the kingship, the crown of the kingdom. Having that personified in a human being is a very great thing. And the, when the people originally asked Shmuel, they wanted to be like all the other nations. But the king of Israel has that potential to rally the people and become more than just any other nation. The king of Israel, there's a lot of strength there lot of strengths and it's something that has been lost obviously since the kingship fell and the destruction of the second temple and the first for that matter in these days of woe of of but there's still so much there and even if there won't be a king even if there will never be an anointed one we can still try to rule ourselves and in doing so right have that <coughs> have that saving of ourselves, as Oregon Freebird said. Best decision ever. I'm inclined to agree. And that's not to poo-poo those who await Messiah. And it's not to say that they're doing anything wrong. Though I have seen different things carried out in the name of Messiah that were completely terrible and awful, and I won't go into those, but Robert returns a shalom to Spooky. What's up, Free? I remember you. Hey, look at that. So Jaden... Oh, he had a message retracted. Okay. Spooky says, chillin', bro. Was that you I saw in Tanakh Talk, Robert? Okay, so, oh, yeah, you're on Tanakh Talk. Uh, people said I should check that out, but it's from what I read, and I've said this before, from what I, from what I have read in the channel description, it's, it's not quite me. It's more for converts, uh, people who consider themselves Noahides, Gentiles. Robert says, oh, wait, uh, Jaden, can someone be a Gentile Nazarite? So, according to strict halakha, Jewish law, let's say, Orthodox Jewish law. And pr presumably the conservatives and reforms and reconstructionists might be uh, on this as well <coughs> and others. But uh, there, technically speaking, there is no Gentile Nazarite because the verses in Numbers 6 start with the word, you know, start with the words, God told Moses, speak to the children of Israel, meaning that the laws of the Nazarite ship were given to the children of Israel and not to the other nations. It's exclusionary. But as I've said before, I've known... Uh, I know digitally, um, mainly, maybe only digitally, probably only digitally. I know Gentiles, Christians, others, um, Rastas, who have taken the Nazarite vow. And as far as I'm concerned, if they feel called to that vow, whether or not they're technically, halachically, by Jewish law, Nazarites is irrelevant because they are doing their own thing. Now, does it achieve the same thing? Does it work in the same way? No, because their vow is not the classic biblical vow. The biblical vow was given to the children of Israel, but Gentiles can take a vow of the Nazarite ship on themselves, and the technicality of it, I suppose, to them shouldn't matter, because if they are Gentiles, it means that they're not keeping Torah and commandments meant for Israel, and that makes the whole that that makes a very big difference. So. I wouldn't judge a Gentile. I wouldn't, I try not to judge anyone. What I'm saying is I wouldn't hold a Gentile Nazarite to the same laws, regulations, standards of halacha and of classic numbers six text 
because it was given to the children of Israel. So you can take on the vow as you can take on any other vow. That's between you and God. You know what I mean? So let's continue here. I was talking. Oh, whoops. I was talking, says Robert. I was talking to them about Judges 13. Judges 13, 22. Let's pull that up right now and see. Uh, let's, again, JPS Tanakh. Let's go for it. JPS Tanakh, Judges 13, 23. I'm on BibleHub.com. And Manoah said unto his wife, We will surely die, because we have seen God. But his wife said unto him, If the Lord were pleased to kill us, he would not receive a burnt offering and a meal offering at our hands. Right? So speaking of the speaking of Nazarites, hey Jaden, talking about Samson. So what exactly were you trying to tell them there, Robert? Um, are you were you talking about the idea of seeing God? Were you talking about something else? I'd love to know. So this idea of seeing God. Uh, God is a name. God is a uh, a revelation. It's not the actual divine itself, right? Again, it's the name that was given, <coughs> passed on through tradition in the Torah, from days of yore and before. Did I do my intro? Did I do my uh, my catchphrase? It's the Nazarite bringing you Hebrew lore from days of yore. No, I don't think I did. And look at that. Hmm? It's been such a long time. I didn't open with my catchphrase. Look at that. So, to have seen God. I wonder if that's what you were going with. Uh, so, Robert, for those, for the uninitiated, Robert is a Christian. So, the idea of seeing God can actually be physical as far as he's concerned. When I read that verse, it's a revelation of God, not God uh, in the flesh. Or, in a, or even in angelic uh, sort of form. It's a revelation of God. Let's see. Okay, Spooky says, I need to look up the verse. Robert, how have you been, bro? Ariel says, hey, Ariel, good to see you. Nice to see you again. He says, hope all is well with you and family, etc. Yes, it is. Preparing for the long night cycle home again, LOL. Well, good. Stay safe. You cycle. You grow all kinds of stuff. Good for you, man. I still think it's one of the world's greatest ironies that I lived in the Netherlands for three years and I went on a bike maybe once after coming off seven years of biking here in Jerusalem. It's just, things there just don't make sense, man. Things that I did, I mean. Um, so yeah, enjoy the cycle home again. Robert says he's good. I won, says Khalid. Good for you, man. <coughs> I don't know anything about... Uh, I don't know anything about fighting in that sense or kickboxing, but a TKO, good for you. So that's, what, with points? But wait, if it's two rounds, you said two rounds, am I correct? Two round TKO. I I don't know enough about the sport to know how you could get a technical knockout. Isn't that, doesn't that have to do with the points that you are awarded during the bout? So someone clarify it for me. How do you win a TKO in two rounds? Shouldn't it be closer to 10 rounds or up to 10 rounds? Because I understand if you actually have a KO and you knock the dude out and he's down for the count and it's done. How do you win with a technical KO in two rounds? I'm missing something because I don't know the sport. Enlighten me. Also, I'm sorry there is no light here. It's all like I, I'm, I'm looking at the screen. I'm not sure how you guys out there are seeing it, but it's all like very, very not. I, I should have a light on me right now. I don't. Anyway, we'll see. Congrats, Khalid. God is great. You are great indeed. Quite a fighter. <coughs> Jaden and Spooky with their nice little emojis of a fly and uh, not a fly, a bee. Or is it a wasp? No, more like a bee. And a bearded man. <laughs> Robert says, any new revelations or anything happen in your life, Achi? Yes. Yes, there is. Um... Well, let's put it this way. First of all, first of all, uh, again, on, on speaking of being back here almost a year, uh, it has been, as I said, quite a year. Uh, I'll tell you one thing that I've been doing recently. For the last six months, I've been hitting the gym. I never belonged to a gym. And uh, I worked out in different times in my life, sometimes somewhat regularly, diligently sometimes. Uh, starting from before I joined the army and since, on and off. Now, this week, in fact, it's going to be, or, or just at the beginning of next week, it's going to be six months. And 
it it's so Rav Kook again mentioning Rav Kook in the lights of returning the lights of repentance in Rota Chuva, <coughs> he says a healthy soul in a healthy body is pulled let's say right it, it must come to the great joy of chuva of returning having that healthy soul and a healthy body is something that i uh when my brother said oh you're going you know i, I spoke to my brother about a month and a half ago and uh, he said well, what's new and i said hey you know i've been hitting the gym and he says oh you've been hitting the gym why yeah and i said and i gave him two reasons first i said you know healthy soul and a healthy body and second, I'm, I quoted uh, uh, Kevin Spacey, like right? Lester Burnham in American Beauty in the film where he starts to run, right? He starts picking up running again. And he says, uh, I want to look good naked. <laughs> Those were my two reasons. Um, new revelations. Well, you know, new revelations in the sense of it's fun to be back in Israel. And I still consider myself just back, you know, even after a year here. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of goodness, despite everything that's going on always in the land of Israel, there's so much good here. So th good things are happening in my life. I am happy to report. And as time goes on, I will give more report, more reports, inshallah. So let's see, too much to tell, says Spooky. Oh, right, because he thought it was, hey, man, Spooky or anyone else, do you, are what new revelations uh, or anything, what has been happening in your lives, do share. I'm interested. I'm sure other people in the chat will be interested. <coughs> Ariel, I have been told my dad had a stroke recently. Any prayers for him and my nan, who passed a few weeks ago, from what I gather, would be appreciated. Wow, so I do hope that he recovers I hope that your father uh, is doing well, will do well, health and happiness and wellness, inshallah. Spooky says, Isaiah, 19, Isaiah 26, 19, the rapture of Yonatan. <laughs> Let's check that out. Wait, what did you say, Jeremiah? What was it? Isaiah, my mistake. Isaiah 26:19 Isaiah 20 ah that's not it Isaiah forgive me the computer's windows are opening here okay Isaiah 26:19 and 20 let's read thy dead shall live my dead bodies shall arise. Awake and sing, ye that dwell in the dust. For thy dew is as the dew of light, and the earth shall bring to life the shades. Come, my people, enter thou into thy chambers, and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself for a little moment, until the indignation be overpassed. Right? That idea of the dead body living, that idea of partaking of the fruit of the tree of life, which we have not partaken of yet, being alive for real, not just here compared to death, not just here in the land of good and evil, but of life, that transcendent life, that original Big Bang that was not a physical one, right? The spiritual Big Bang that, that preceded it. <coughs> Cheers, dude, says Ariel. Spooky says, and to you, man, the spooky, uh, spooky says the Redeemer will stand afar on the latter days of the earth, Mount Olive, right? al I have to go. See you later, family. Ta'ot Spooky. I hope you were here for some of the, I hope you were here for some of the talking. I don't know when you left or when you didn't, but good. I'm, I'm happy you were here for some of it. Thank you. Thank all of you, incidentally, for joining. My friend William runs Tanakh Talk. Check it out. He hosts Tovia Singer Weekly. Well, yeah, I've, I've just been told that it's not my thing. And from what I read, it's not my thing. From clips and bits I saw, it's not my thing. But I can totally understand how other people would be into it. Hebrew Nazarite. Of course, I'm a follower of Yeshua, he says. And saying God came to earth as a form of angel because Samson's parents was afraid they were actually going to die. Well, yes, it's the divine revelation. The angel is a divine messenger. He conveys that will of God. So 
Shimshon's parents were afraid where they were going to die. Actually, it was just the male who was afraid. It was just the husband, just the father, Manoach, who said that, <coughs> who was afraid that they were going to die. And it was, as, as we read, it was the wife of Manoach who said that, no, 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 it wouldn't have happened this way if that's what was meant to happen. If, if, you know, that was when it would not have happened this way. Ariana says, speaking of Job, it definitely seems like God had done a, a Job on me recently, wondering if I will ever see my family member again, all dead in bad health, in places I can't morally visit or miss him. Well, I'll read that again. Speaking of Job, it definitely seems like God has done a Job on me recently, a job or a Job, huh? Wondering if I will ever see any family member again, all dead in bad health, in places I can't morally visit or miss him. That's heavy, man. I don't know what to say to that. And I, though, wondering those things can be a real uh, thorn in, in, in one side, to put it delicately. I'm sorry to hear that you're going through hardship. All I can say is, I hope you do better. You know, quote Jim Rohn, don't wish things were easier, wish you were better. Old Jim Rohn. All kinds of bad things happen in this life. It's par for the course. I hope that you will be able to climb out and eventually somehow, somehow, get over your grief. You're right? Job, at the end of Job, he was richer than before with all those daughters, the most beautiful in all the land. But I have no doubt that he still missed his old life uh, in some ways and grieved for it and had that hole in his life, you know what I mean? Like a deep pit of, of some kind of sadness, inescapable, until the day he died, if he did exist. And it's a testament to the human spirit and will that we are able to let time heal wounds and act in a way that will heal ourselves where we can <coughs> recover and carry on and i hope that you will be able to get through this get through this storm and even if there is a storm all around your life and things are hectic and nuts that you'll be able to hear god calling you from within that storm as Job did i am too robert all right speaking of being a uh, follower of yeshua uh okay i go now bye bye see you next time god willing we will see each other next time i really want to keep doing these again ciao says spooky Robert says, I got to meet Shiloh Ben Hod, an Israeli musician band came to North Carolina. Oh, you know what? You've been following them for a while. You even sent you even sent me a couple of their links. You know, Christian rock and gospel music. I don't connect with it. Uh, I don't connect with it, really. It's not just that it has to do with Yeshua, who I don't consider to be a Messiah or a king or a savior for me, as far as I'm concerned. Although he may have been a sage and a master and a someone to follow, right, at the time. But uh, I, I treat this, these gospel things and Christian rock things uh, conceptually. The melodies might be fine, right? And the, the, the music might be good. And <clears throat> but I treat it in the same way as I would treat, uh, let's say, ultra-Orthodox. And I don't like that term at all. But, you know, Haredi, ultra-Orthodox uh, people who take a popular mainstream poppy song and slap uh, psalm, right? Mu uh, uh, lyrics, s s words of the Psalms on it. It's like, yeah, the words are from the Psalms, but uh, it's not, it does, doesn't speak to me. But definitely, if uh, I'm happy you got to meet them, was it, it was the whole band? Yeah, the Messianic band. Good for you, man. I know that you enjoy their music. It must have been fun to, it must have been fun to, um, uh, to meet them and uh, obviously probably see them live. Jaden says, I seen an angel, a angel, and it read me some of the numbers, chapter six, and asked, do you agree? And I said, I agree, and I became a Nazarite. So let me ask you, speaking of uh, Shimshon famously became a Nazarite through divine messenger and not by his own volition. He did not make the vow. It was made externally on him, right, given to him. He was birthed into it. That's what the angel says, right? From the belly, from the stomach. <coughs> right, from the womb, rather. But it says beten or baten. Baten? Baten. 
And there's a reason that it says belly or stomach and not womb, but that's a whole other issue. Um, let's see. So you agreed to become a Nazarite when a divine messenger uh, came to you and read you some of that and said, do you agree? So it was of your own accord, right? So you did it of your own accord, but it was something you agreed to. It was something that was offered to you, which that you, uh, that you took. I like, I mean, I like the way that you phrased it. It's interesting. Every time, every time uh, a different Nazarite, you know, every time I speak to different Nazarites, be they, you know, technical uh, Hebrew biblical Nazarites or, or not, it's always uh, it's always a very interesting story. I love people's origin story of the Naz of how they got to the Nazarite ship. So thank you for sharing, and uh, it's one that I haven't heard of before, though it does ring true as far as. <laughs> it doesn't ring a bell as far as the Samson story is concerned. Now, I, I'm Jaden, if you don't mind, if, and if you're still here, what were you doing at the time? Were you meditating? Was it, uh, was it in what way? Was it a vision, meaning when you were awake? Or was it uh, a dream when you were asleep? Or was it something in between? Can you elaborate? I'm very interested in the revelation you had and in the... Uh, and when was it? And how have you been keeping the Nazarite ship? Are you keeping the strict biblical law? How far are you taking it? I'd love to know more. Uh, Robert says, in Israel. So people ask you about your Nazir locks at all? Uh, no, one person this year. Uh, one person, I think, this year. I was on the bus. I may have mentioned it. I think I mentioned it at the time because I was still broadcasting at the time pretty regularly. And I think I mentioned it in one of the previous recent videos, recent chronologically, right? Because it hasn't been recent in the last few weeks. But you get my, you get, you get the point. Uh, and he asked me, and we spoke of it a bit. So, and and I mentioned that I met a fellow Nazarite in Yerushalayim, and I plan to meet others that I know of now that he revealed to me. So no, people don't ask. One person asked. People don't ask. Taylor, hey, Taylor, hello, good to see you. Yo, I finally figured out the Mishnah Arachin 8-7 Conundrum. Figured out the 8-7 conundrum. Well, the first thing is you need to take it in context. Like any, like many, many places in the Talmud, <coughs> you need to take it in the context of the sugiya, right? Of, of the of the back and forth, the dialogue. But please share. And first of all, for those who don't know, share a little bit more since it's been a while for me. Share a bit more if you can, Taylor, on the on what the conundrum in a nutshell is, right? What's the conundrum, what's the conundrum of the Mishnah? In Arachin 8 7. Wait, you said Mishnah. I'm think I might be thinking of the Talmud. Hold on a second. I'm gonna pull that up. Uh, I'm gonna pull that up a second. I'm trying to understand. Um, okay, so you mentioned the Mishnah. I think that what I I think that what I spoke of was the, the Talmud. Hang on a second, people. I won't waste your time. I just need to look something up here and realize if I'm talking about the right thing or not. Uh, <coughs> okay. So, Chet. Wait, so the Mishnah, you're talking about the Mishnah of Achin 8 7. So here's 8 and 7. Okay. Um, all right, so yeah, give me give me your thoughts on it. I'd love to. Okay, so let's see. Uh, I'll keep, we'll keep going. Uh, I'll come back to you, Taylor, and you know you type up what you need to type up. Have you heard, says Robert, that there is a lot of sewage in the Jordan? Makes sense. And Israel, United States, and Jordan are trying to clean it. Nevertheless, it's still the holiest river on earth. It just might be. I wouldn't know. But when we see what Elisha told the general of the Aramites to do, right? Naaman told him, go bathe in the, in the river Jordan. And he said, bathe in the river Jordan. I thought this prophet will come out here and call to his God and do something and my leprosy will be taken away. They want me to bathe in a river? I've got rivers in Syria. I'll go there. In Aram, rather. I'll go there. But no, 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 no. He went there. He dipped himself in the river seven times and his flesh became pure as a young boy. All right. 
Robert says, oh, wait, I'm sorry, I read that. So no, I have not heard there's sewage in the Jordan. I'm not surprised. I'm happy people are doing something to clean it. And nevertheless, it might be the holiest of rivers. Indeed, definitely, definitely has seen a lot. <laughs> if we take the Tanakh into account at all. Taylor 26 says, are people in Israel anticipating the Messiah, the Messianic era this century? People are, are always anticipating the Messianic era. It's it's sort of a, a strength and a weakness. To, it depends on the nature of yourself as an individual. Because there are people who spend a lot of time yearning for Messiah, but then they are disillusioned by this, that, or the other, and so they throw the baby out with the bathwater. On the other hand, there are those who uh, are never disillusioned, who go whole hog, you know, and all Messiah, but they neglect to some degree the life here in this world, and they don't cultivate enough of a pillar themselves. This is not a judgment, it's just an observation. And so when they, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, anyway, when they put all of their proverbial eggs in the messianic basket, it and when they are clinging to some degree to this figure, this anointed one, this chosen king who will bring everything, you know, all of all of the divine revelation and the building of the temple and the and the the uh, eradication of Amalek, <clears throat> the gathering of the tribes, right? Putting all of that on a on a single individual when there hasn't been a king for such a long time and it, there will be such controversy if and when he does arrive and it's all connected with so much war, bloodshed, or potential war and bloodshed. It's difficult to, uh, it's difficult to, there is a lot of anticipation, but I think that the mainstream everyday Joe is perhaps, I don't know, I, I, I don't, you know what? I'm, I'm, I'm gonna say yes. I'm going to say yes, people are anticipating Messiah as they have ever since the destruction of the Second Temple, you know, ever since the fall of the monarchy. People have been anticipating it. Is it well placed? Is it well executed? I don't know. I've seen I've seen I've seen it both ways. I'll just say that I've people in Israel are anticipating it. But I think that while that anticipation, right, that looking forward to something, the expectation even of Messiah are that should play some sort of a part because it is a good thing. It's supposed to symbolize the unity of the tribes and returning to ourselves and again the 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 the, the building of the temple and all of that coming together as a human people. The tree of life, that whole thing, putting that putting putting those gears in motion. But you you, you shouldn't forget your brother and sister who are here now. They may not be the Messiah but they're your brother and sister. You know? Hey, all, says Jesus. How have you been, Yona? I've been very, very good. Thank you for asking. Good to have you here. Spooky says, plans change. I'm back, Yonatan. Check out the song In the House by Crowder. I'm assuming you're not talking about Steven Crowder. Hold on, I'll copy that into a different tab. What's up, Jesus? Says Spooky. Robert says, what's up, Achie? You live in you live near the Netherlands. Jesus says, it's been a while, eh? Yes, it has been, Jesus. It has been a while. And yes, he's in Belgium. All right, so Taylor came back about Mishnah, the Mishnah in Arachim. Uh, so the Mishnah in Arachim primarily deals with the worth of things. Arachim literally means values. And it speaks, if I'm not mistaken, let's say that you have something that you need to bring to the temple, something that you vowed or, or something which was uh, the fourth year of a fruit-bearing tree that you're supposed to consume in purity in Zion. If you don't want to make the whole trip with everything, you can sell that wherever you are locally. Bring the money, right, the value of the fourth uh, fruit, the, the fruit of the fourth year of a fruit-bearing tree. You take the money, and you bring it to Jerusalem, and there you buy your ale, you buy your wine, you buy your meat, you do whatever, you are happy, <coughs> and it still happens in Jerusalem. And if I'm not mistaken, this it sort of deals with that kind of thing, of the value and the worth of different things, sacrifices, uh, things that you vow to give as a sacrifice. That's the, that's the Mishnah, that's the premise of the Mishnah, of this tractate, Arachim. So, 
Mishnah Lachin 8.7 is not mistaken, but it was easy to misinterpret, if you will. The firstborn consecration is truly complex. Okay, so we're talking about the firstborn here. The firstborn of the children of Israel, right? We're talking about the worth of things. The firstborn of the children of Israel needs to be sort of traded in, redeemed, as it's as it as it were, uh, in the presence of a priest, right, of a Kohen. The consecration of the firstborn is truly complex, he says. It very much changed from Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers, right, where, if I'm not mistaken, right, it wasn't always uh, pieces of eight, right, or, or not of eight, it wasn't always pieces of, of silver. It was uh, pieces of eight is gold. <clears throat> it wasn't always pieces of silver, right? Now, if I'm not mistaken, it's silver, or is it chamisha slaim? I forget what weight in shekels that actually is, but anyway, the the firstborn of the children of, of the a firstborn of the children of Israel who is not of the tribe of Levi, so not a Levite or a priest. I, for instance, did not have to go through this. On the thirtieth day of a male child being born to a Israelite man. Uh, and woman, because if one of them is from the tribe of Levi, you don't need to redeem the firstborn. But the firstborn uh, baby, right, boy, is basically traded in, right? The priest shows up, or they do it someplace where the father is there, the baby is there, <coughs> and and the priest says, what do you want? Do you want this money, or do you want your firstborn? And the father says, I want my firstborn. You keep the money, O oh priest. And it's sort of uh, like the life, let's say, that life of the firstborn child is then um, consecrated. And originally, before the tribe of Levi got the duty of being the carriers of the Ark of the Covenant and being priests and all that, it was the firstborn of Israel, of all the tribes who were supposed to carry that, uh, that burden, let's say, of being uh, closer to God and teachers and all of that Levitical stuff. And then after the sin of the golden calf, it was taken away from them uh, uh, and given to the tribe of Levi. But there is something of the tribe of Levi which had that to begin with. I won't get into it. <coughs> so we're talking about the consecration of the firstborn. And it changes, he says, from Exodus to Leviticus to Numbers. And because there is a, uh, a change there going on, I don't remember the exact wording in the Mishnah or in those verses pertaining to the firstborn and the consecration, but I do remember it's mentioned several times, and uh, so it very much changed, he says, and let's continue. This is the whole idea. The firstborn sacrifice is a specific kind of sacrifice, says Taylor. The firstborn sacrifice cannot be consecrated as another kind of sacrifice, burnt sin or guilt offering. Right, so it's something very unique that takes place only once under certain circumstances, and you can't trade it for another kind of, uh, once you consecrate the firstborn in such a way, you can't trade it for something else. So let's see, let's see if he, wait, uh, uh, ooh, uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna come down here and then come, and then go back. I want to continue Taylor's uh, words here. For example, Levit Leviticus 12 says you must present two offerings after a woman gives birth: a burnt offering and a sin offering. You cannot present a firstborn animal for one of these offerings. Oh, okay, so you're not talking about a consecrated firstborn human. You're talking about the consecrated firstborn lamb or uh, goat. And those uh, are offered unto God. So my mistake, everything I said was true to the human consecration of the firstborn. Now we are talking about the firstborn in animals. My bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> <coughs> Hang on a second. Okay, so let's continue. Now that I now, now that I'm on track, forgive me. I mean, what I said was true, but to the human firstborn of not not of the tribe of Levi, not the animal firstborn. Okay, so let's see. So, <clears throat> as to the context of Leviticus 27:26, Taylor says, "Do not consecrate the firstborn, as it already belongs to God." So let's see. <coughs> Oi. Does he continue? I'm, I'm assuming that he's he might be writing a little bit more. <coughs> okay, so I've been speaking for almost an hour. And now I can feel that the cough is... Because now I've been speaking for an hour, and I can feel that tickle. Whereas usually with this post-COVID cough that I've been trying to get rid of, there's not even a, an irritation or a tickle in the throat. It just is still there lingering. But 
now, after speaking for almost an hour, I can feel that. So I'm not going to push my luck. I'm going to say good night, and I'm sorry that I can't continue the chat so much. I deeply regret that I can't continue, but I want to give you my full attention, as I've said before. I won't be able to do that if I'm coughing, if I'm feeling this irritation. You have given me all of you out there, those watching now, those watching, uh, those who watched and left, or <sighs> such a blessed hour. I am so grateful, so thankful, so humbled that you tuned in. I hope uh, that I'll be able to be back tomorrow or the next day, continue the chat, and then maybe speak of something else. But definitely come back to this chat. So many uh, good things going on here, even though I <laughs> completely mistook the consecration of the firstborn thing and I spoke of the human and not the animal. I will make right of that. <coughs> God willing, I plan on going live again tomorrow. M maybe not, maybe the next day. But I definitely do want to do it to come back strong. And if I'm not mistaken, tomorrow is a Wednesday, and I'm supposed to be doing it anyway, right? Monday, Wednesday, Friday. I hope that to go back to that or more, it's been missing from my life. But I digress. Right now, I just want to thank you. I'm going to say reluctantly, honestly, reluctantly, I'm going to say good night. I don't want to. I don't want to have this cough ruin uh, the continuation of the broadcast of the would-be broadcast. So thank you once again. I hope to see you again <coughs> very, very soon to keep reading this chat. If you have comments, please leave them. I will definitely be answering comments uh, today, tomorrow, and whenever you know me. I try to answer every single one of them that I can. Sometimes I miss them. They go to the spam, whatever. Um, but I do try to get to every single one because I care about what you have to say. And I care about the dialogue that we are having here. I've learned so much from having this channel, and it's part of why I want to just keep going and going and going. <coughs> despite the setbacks, despite the uh, the post-COVID situation that I've been dealing with, it's very mild, and I'm ready to come back. So please, you guys out there, be on my ass. Say, hey, didn't you say you're going to broadcast? Let's go, let's go, let's go. Uh, and, and by all means, send questions, wonderings, uh, comments, concerns, whatever you have, so I can open it up here in the chat and talk about it. Enlighten me, educate me on this, that, or the other. I always love to learn new things, to discuss them, as those who follow me know. This has been a long goodbye. But it's difficult to say goodbye after such a long time being away and I've been speaking uh, almost an hour now and it's and the chat has been so giving and wonderful. I've got six people viewing now and at one point we had I think nine and four likes and I appreciate it. I don't take it for granted. You guys could be doing anything else right now. There's a whole world out there but we're doing this. It has significance. To me, I hope that it also has significance for you. I hope that I merit your attention and that I <coughs> and that I'm able to um, that I'm able to open our minds a little bit, hopefully. So Laila Tov, God bless. Thank you all. I appreciate it.